Um, I'm really excited to be here talking to all of you today. This is the largest group of people I think I've ever talked to in my life. So you'll have to forgive me if I'm a little bit nervous. Um, and I've forgotten my sacrifice to the demo gods, so you'll be here to watch my horrible humiliation, indubitably. <laughs> so get those cameras ready, it's gonna be great. Um, the, uh, the title of this talk turned out to be uh, very fortuitous considering all of the talk that we've had in the keynote, um, in the keynotes both uh, today and yesterday about um, how it is, how our goal at Docker is to give people revolutionary change without requiring them to be revolutionaries. Um, Justin did a really great job of introducing me, but here's some more information. Um, if you ever want to get in touch with me, the best way is by Twitter. Uh, my Twitter's my wallet name. Um, and I am a maintainer of the Mirage OS Unikernel project, um, and I'm also a maintainer of VPN Kit, which is one of the components of Docker for Mac and Docker for Windows. If you saw Justin's amazing talk yesterday, um, you'll already have a pretty good idea of what it is that VPN Kit does and how it makes it possible for you to use the surprisingly complicated network setup you probably have on your personal desktop with containers easily and transparently. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how these two projects have an awful lot to do with one another um, and how, they're, um, how the use of the things that we've made in Mirage OS in VPN Kit are a really good example of the kind of incremental but really powerful change that we can make when we disaggregate, um, when, when we use library operating systems to disaggregate some of the systems code that we've had locked up in the kernel for ages and ages. Um, I've mentioned Docker for Windows and Docker for Mac a few times already. If you don't already have them, they're now freely available. Um, you can go to docker.com and there's a nice big uh, button right on the front page um, where, you can grab the, where you can grab that software and get started and start making bug reports for me to deal with. So um, first off, some definitions. Uh, you guys probably all know what Docker is by this point. Um, if you just arrived and you've come for just the tail end of the conference, um, it's a really cool thing that's got a picture of a whale. Um, and you, can, you should probably go to a couple other talks uh, throughout the, 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 for the rest of the day and kind of get your bearings. Um, when I talk about unikernels, um, I'm talking about an artifact that represents a set of software which runs in a single address space with no <coughs> distinction between kernel and user space code. And what that means is you don't have um, your software is not a supplicant to something else. You don't have to go off and make syscalls and beg the kernel to please, please, please do what I want if I've turned the right knobs and I've said all my prayers and I've eaten my vegetables. In a unikernel, you have access to, you have access to that stuff directly. And I'll talk a little bit more about the implications of that later. Um, I've also already used the term library operating system. Um, if, you, if you're not familiar with one of these, if you hadn't had a chance to play with them, they're super great, I would recommend it. They're a build system which can link a group of libraries which represent these traditional operating systems functions like networking and storage um, with an application in order to produce a unikernel. So when I say artifact, there are a number of different things that I could mean by that. Um, so, we had a really great quote in the keynote this morning that nobody cares about containers. And I think it's actually the case that nobody really cares about unikernels either. They have a set of things that they want, which is they want to be able to have some expression of their will in the form of software, which is their application code. This is the stuff that says, like, um, make the blockchain and make me a bajillionaire. Um, or um, let people vote for whether or not they like cats or dogs or whatever your, your huge desire, your plan to make your mark on the world is. And you want some way to easily describe how to make this be a real thing completely. So you have, um, you have the whole set of things that your software that you've written needs. And you also need something that's low overhead. You don't want, um, you don't want the thing that you're creating that houses your beautiful expression of desire to be something that costs you a lot of money to actually run in the real world. You don't want it to be something that needs a ton of CPU for no reason. You don't want it to be massive so you have to buy a lot of disk. You don't want it to take a really long time to run when it's off doing things that you don't care about that aren't counting the votes for cats and dogs. You want, 
your application that counts votes for cats and dogs to like be super duper into counting votes for cats and dogs and not really into doing other stuff. So I would submit to you that the reason people are interested in unikernels is not is generally not because they're like a super interesting, exciting research project with a lot of potential for how we're going to go forth in operating systems research. They're interested in something that fulfills these requirements. So I wanted to look at a few other kinds of artifacts that we often generate when we're making software. The first sort of style of dealing with this problem of I have some, I have some software and I need to um, uh, basically, I need to make this be a real thing, make it run, um, get it out of my brain and into the world. This is the sort of, uh, sort of Python and Ruby model of how I take my code and make it be real. You, uh, you have some file that represents your application code or many files, that's your source. You have some kind of environment, it's an interpreter and its dependencies, or maybe you're using a compiled language, um, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, you have some, probably have some external application dependencies, so like, this is the stuff that you have to go and get with pip install or whatever it is that uh, we use in Node this week. Um, <laughs> and then all of that stuff runs on top of an operating system, which has, uh, in addition to the kernel, a set of shared libraries that all of that other stuff, uh, the interpreter and the external application dependencies, might have some dependency on. So this is when you're, you're going along and you're doing a whole pip install of a whole bunch of stuff and everything is going super great. And then you also need to apt-get install some stuff that usually ends in like dash dev and it's like, okay, fine, cool. Uh, weird, but okay. Um, and then finally, you have some silicon that knows how to, um, how to execute some instructions. Uh, this is, uh, of course, a gross oversimplification, but it's a 45-minute talk, um, so I, I hope you're all cool with it. Um, so if you've done a lot of work in an environment like this, you've probably discovered that this way of distributing your software is a really good way to end up with a lot of runtime errors. You have your really nice piece of software. It's a, perhaps a collection, a collection of Ruby files and you say to your friend, hey friend, I wrote this really amazing app that lets you vote for um, whether you wanna go to Burger King or Pizza Hut. And you can run it on your machine and it's gonna be super great. And your friend goes, okay, um, oh man, I even have Ruby from that one time I tried Ruby, this is gonna be great. I'm missing 12 million packages. I can't run this. And you're like, man, this sucks. I don't want to tell you how to install 12 million packages. This is the worst. So maybe you have a different language, and you're like, OK, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to use a compiler. I'm going to compile on my software. There's going to be a binary. I'm just going to send the binary. It's going to be great. Uh, except it's not, because you still have um, dependencies on some operating system that your binary knows how to, how to ask things for, uh, ask for things from. Um, you still have dependencies on these shared libraries. Um, and you also have no guarantee that, um, I, I didn't bring this up before, but this is true for the previous example as well. You have no guarantee that there's been any consistency in the build environment between times that, you, uh, that you've invoked this process, the, the compiler and its dependencies in order to produce this binary. So it can be very difficult to tell, okay, I have this application code and I have this binary. Do they actually have anything to do with one another? Um, if you've ever tried to solve this mystery, um, I'm sorry, and I feel for you. And I really enjoy that uh, I, I've, I've now structured my life such that I don't have to try to answer this question very often, and A plus would recommend. So, okay, shared libraries suck. We have static linking. Um, we, can, we can pull all of the shared libraries that we need um, when we're building a binary into our binary, and then we'll really, really, really seriously have everything. Uh, the problem with, with this is the shared libraries are shared for a reason. If every single application that you want to run um, is linking them in, everything gets really huge really quickly. Um, we like to pretend that we live in a world where disk space is, is infinite because it's so cheap, but I promise you that if you do this all the time, you will quickly realize that things do still cost money, even disk. Um, it's st it also has the same problem of the build environment not really being very reproducible. So, Here's, here's the solution that I think many of you here have gotten to, which is, okay, I'll take my application code, I'll take a specification of some kind of base image that I wanna run the application on top of, plus all of the dependencies that it has, plus all of the configuration that I have to do to make the thing actually run. I'll take all that together, I'll run it through Docker build, I'll get an image, I'll run a container based on that image. Everything is super great. 
There are no problems. I've specified everything. My life is amazing. Uh, maybe. So um, it's, it certainly can be the case uh, that you have some external dependencies that you can express in your Docker file but aren't reproducible. So it's really easy to do things like say, OK, AP, um, you're doing an Alpine Docker file. And you say, OK, APK update and APK install some stuff. And suddenly you don't really have any guarantee that you have the same version of whatever it was that you had last time that you built it. So that can be a problem. Um, and it's also the case that sometimes your applications care about the operating system that's running underneath it. The thing that uh, you, you can see this really clearly in the fact that we have Docker run dash dash privilege. Sometimes we, sometimes we need to do things like run, uh, like chain, like run syscontrol or um, do some tuning or install kernel modules. And that means that we have some dependencies that aren't nicely expressed in our Docker file. They're, they're not nicely expressed in our image. So there's something else we can do about that. We can pull all those operating system dependencies up into our artifact as well. So then we end up with something that has our application code, our dependencies, uh, both the application's dependencies, so um, any libraries that we might be using, um, the, whatever equivalent of uh, NumPy, for example, you might have, um, plus the operating system dependencies, so something that knows how to talk to a network, for example. Run it through something that knows how to build unikernels. Uh, pick your favorite unikernel and put it here. Um, and you'll get out some artifact, which is one of these single address space um, runnable things. And once you have one of these, you can uh, apply it to something that knows how to run unikernels on top of a computer. The canonical example is a hypervisor like Zen or KVM. Um, but you could, you could, in fact, run one on top of bare metal if you wanted to. Um, there's uh, the, basically, the, uh, the, there's no theoretical reason why you couldn't do that. Um, it's just nobody seems very. It, Nobody seems like so super duper pumped about it right now that they're in front of this giant room telling you about it, but I hope that next year they will. So um, this, is, this sort of reflects what we do um, when we build, uni when, uh, at least when we build unikernels in the Mirage OS space, which is the space that I'm familiar with. We have, these, we have these specifications that we sort of roll up into this unikernel builder, and then we say, OK, I got my unikernel. But um, in the application dependency step, we actually do pretty much the equivalent of APK update um, and APK install. So we can do better than that. We can build unikernels in containers. And then we, get the nice, uh, then we can conceivably get the nice qualities of, OK, I've specified my build environment, and I have something reproducible. But also, I have this new kind of artifact that I can, um, that I can hopefully use to, uh, that I can uh, used to sort of kick out all of the dependencies of the traditional operating system and the stuff that might need to run a container. So I'm going to try a demo now. I appreciate your enthusiasm. Is the, oh, that's not a good sign. There we go. Yay. <laughs> so I have a container running right now, which is my slides. So uh, hopefully I won't screw everything up uh, badly enough that I lose those. Um, if so, it'll be a short talk. Thank you for having paid attention. Um, I also have a whole bunch of other images. And I have one in particular called Mirage Hello. So I'm going to show you where I built that from, if I can find it. There we go. Yeah, there we go. This uh, Mirage Skeleton is a repository of a whole bunch of demonstration unikernels that we've built for Mirage. Um, if you're interested in getting started, uh, there's a GitHub repository where you can go look at them. It has examples of, that's probably a little bit hard to read, so I'll highlight it and that might help. Um, we have examples of stuff like building a static website, building a static website with TLS, yay! Um, using, uh, using disks, um, doing network stuff, all that kind of thing. And I'm just gonna show you the world. Oops, I'm in there already, that's why I can't go there. So. I said a bunch of stuff about how it would be really nice to do a reproducible environment for building unikernels, and I'm going to show you like the least reproducible Docker file ever um, after having said all of that. So um, we have uh, we have some base images that say, okay, here's how here's the um, uh, underlying software for building unikernels. We're going to do a whole bunch of setup stuff to get that up, including the thing that I said right away that you shouldn't do. Um, we're going to invoke um, an application package manager to install a bunch of dependencies. 
and then we're going to run our unikernel builder right here. And um, I'm running uh, Cubes OS, if you're wondering what, that, uh, what that's all about. Um, sorry, and I need to uh, run that interactively to show you what we've done. So here we have um, a whole bunch of the output of what we did when we built a unikernel. The, uh, the artifact that we've generated is this mirror console.zen. So we can have a look at that. Um, this, is a, this is something that's uh, roughly the size of, an, of, um, of Alpine, but could be much smaller. Um, if, we, if we had a slightly smarter compiler that we had built it with, we could be doing dead code elimination and make this much, much, much smaller so that it actually represented only, um, only, the, parts of, only the parts of the operating system, um, only the specific parts of stuff that knows how to print out to console that we need. Let me show you the, uh, the code that we're actually running here, by the way. This is, um, this is some example code that just uh, is your basic hello world. So it seems um, it's a bit unsatisfying, honestly, to have a four and a half megabyte binary um, that we've generated from just the results of hello world. But if, we can, if, but if we consider that if this is the only thing that we need to run, and let's imagine that it's a more exciting application like voting on cats versus dogs. If this is the only thing that we need to run, it might actually be pretty exciting to replace, uh, to replace uh, an, entire, an entire stack that involves, for example, a Linux VM, the stuff that we need to manage containers, and then a whole bunch of multiplex containers like this. Um, I would really like to show you this running, um, but uh, an unfortunate side effect of running on cubes is that I have basically broken my ability to do that about 10 minutes before the demo. So um, you'll just have to trust me that if you have access to a nice Zen hypervisor, you can, uh, you can take this uh, mirror console and you can get, actually I'll show you um, similar output to um, when you compile the code to run as a Unix process. This is the, um, basically the unikernel builder also has some facility to target a different kind of artifact where it just, uh, where it just builds a traditional binary. So instead of my mirror console.zen, if I make this, oops, I have something that I can just run in my container or it could run in my traditional, um, in my traditional operating system outside the container if I wanted to. It would, be nice, it would be nice to have a slightly better looking Docker file to show you. Um, if there is, uh, I'm going to post the repository with these slides, um, including, the, uh, including the Docker file that built that, and uh, I welcome pull requests. A side effect of being hired um, as part of an acquisition uh, for Docker is that you don't actually have to know anything about Docker to get hired. Uh, <laughs> if any of you are looking for exciting backdoor ways in, now you know. Um, here's a, here's uh, some more information um, about where the, uh, where the source for that comes from if you wanted to get started on building unikernels yourself in Docker. Um, there's also Docker images for another unikernel project, the HalVM, um, lest I be accused of being partisan toward my own project, which I would absolutely never do. Never. So I mentioned operating system dependencies a couple of times in the context of library operating systems. And here are some examples of the things that I mean by that. These are the things that um, when you're, uh, it's, it's really obvious in some languages when you're, um, when you're making a call to the operating system to say, please give me the current time or please set up a socket or um, please give me like a super duper random number or maybe just a kind of random number. Um, some languages wrap this up really nicely for you so that you don't actually know that you're calling into, uh, that you're calling into a kernel and calling into your operating system as opposed to just talking to uh, some application dependency like all, of the other application, uh, like all of the other libraries you deal with. But in a traditional operating system, there is a fairly big divide here. Um, and even if you have a whole lot of nice stuff on top of the syscalls that you're having to make into the kernel, the actual interface is um, usually really tightly defined um, it might not play nicely with the kind of expressiveness that the language that you're trying to program in has. 
So for example, um, the interfaces that I've seen for networking, even in languages with really strong type systems, usually are just, please give me a buffer uh, with some bytes in it and an int. Um, and I'll do, go away and I'll do some stuff that's side effecting and I'll just take care of it. This is, um, this is a really ugly thing to have um, in the middle of your code, even if it's nicely hidden away from you by a whole bunch of other stuff that people have done to make it look like this call is part of your application code. So having it actually be part of your applica application code is really nice. And having some way to, um, let me flip back for a minute. Um, the, the, other, uh, the other problem with this is that you have very little capacity for configuring um, how these particular things are implemented if you want to do that. So if you, <clears throat> you might have some, uh, some knobs that you can twiddle in somewhere like proc, or you might have some things that you can change with something like sysctl, which is, um, which some of you might be really familiar with, judging by the number of requests to allow sysctl. We get in Docker for Windows and Docker for Mac. But um, your ability to actually configure these is also pretty limited. If you, and if you wanted to do your own, if you wanted to change something about the implementation, you have to do a kernel patch, which um, if you talk to the people who are responsible for your ops and you say, hey, I need this really, um, I need to change this value to something that's like really far outside the norm, and I just really need like this one tiny little kernel patch, uh, good luck with that. Um, you will be very popular, I'm sure. And you also like, if you don't already know how to do kernel programming, you have to learn how to do kernel programming and um, maybe you're smarter than me, but that's not like a one night job for me personally. Um, in that context, I wanted to mention a project called, uh, called Rump, which is a project that takes the, uh, the net, uh, the, I'm gonna say the wrong BSD now and then everyone's gonna be mad at me. Uh, it's not BSD, right? Yeah. <laughs> That takes the, um, that takes the um, drivers from NetBSD and makes them libraries. And uh, the person who's responsible for this project uh, made this really great tweet. The, entire, the, the original motivation for the project was to just make these, dri these drivers easier to debug and easier to deal with. So just to, pull, just to pull these things out of this monolithic kernel so that you can suddenly deal with them like you deal with application code is really powerful. So even if, even if you're in a situation where you want to do, um, where you want to do something like a, a patch to a traditional kernel, the ability to pull these things out and work on them just by itself is really, really nice. But it's even nicer if you can work on this stuff in the same environment that you're used to working in. If you can, you have all your normal IDE tools, use your normal debugger, um, not have to learn an entirely new language. And when you're in that situation, suddenly you're a badass kernel hacker. You're a systems programmer. The, wor the world is in your hands. Like, the power is yours. Um, so most, uh, most of the library operating systems projects uh, will provide some kind of implementation for things that are really common dependencies, like networking or storage. But a lot of them are swappable. So you can say, OK, um, here's, uh, I'll use Mirage OS again as, as an example, just because it's the one I'm most familiar with. You have some definition of what it means to be a network device. You know how to send some stuff. You know how to receive some stuff. That's all very nice. Um, and, as long, and you can write some code that as long as it fulfills that contract, it's a driver. Good job. You wrote it in your normal IDE. Maybe you wrote some unit tests. Maybe you had a really good time thinking about, OK, as a side effect, maybe, it can like, maybe I can like also use a console and like print out all the stuff to the console, or I can like make all the packets be delayed by a while. It's up to you. You're the boss. And this is good for more than just having fun with making, uh, with making silly drivers, which I think is a good enough end in and of itself, but if you need like, a practical thing to do with it, uh, I'll give you a few. Um, a lot of the common ways that software goes wrong is it tries to do something with the external world, usually mediated through the kernel, and there's some reason that that can't be done. Um, and the kernel, uh, and maybe you get a report back Maybe this is a really uncommon error path, so you either like, don't check for errors or you have some kind of error handler that itself has a bug in it and there's some horrible cascading, uh, cascading amount of failure. If you are into reading postmortems, um, if you start reading them with this in mind, you will discover that this and configuration changes um, are responsible for a horrific amount of carnage. If you have a library operating system, you can write modules that stress test these situations. 
So you don't have, um, so you don't have to deal with like elaborate mocks or anything. You can just drop in your implementation that uh, always makes some edge case be true. So like maybe you have um, an implementation that is a network interface that just always has a bajillion packets waiting, and every time, every time it's possible for a packet to arrive, like a whole mess of packets arrive. Um, maybe you're trying to test something that wants to deal with randomness, um, but you want to but you want to make sure that you always have the same output. So you just stub that out with a static list. That's reasonably easy to do in most traditional um, traditional environments, but. It's really nice to be sure that you're actually exercising the same code path in your application, because the thing that you swapped out from underneath it is totally different. Um, entropy resources that always block. So if you really, really need like a super, like a real good random number to seed something, you're just never going to get it. And make sure your application doesn't do anything that it shouldn't. Like make sure it's not just going to use zero. That's bad. Don't do that. Um, file systems are always full. Block, de block devices are always busy. Um, get host by name is a uh, um, call that a lot of people, uh, and it's a more modern equivalent, it's a call that a lot of people make not really thinking about the fact that they're relying on an entire complicated subsystem uh, DNS. So maybe you wrote a DNS library that just always returns super trustworthy dot please give me your creds dot com for all A records. So those are some exciting things that you can do. Um, when you're writing your own operating systems libraries for your applications. But another side effect of having these things be um, on an equal plane is that you can take these operating systems libraries and like, just use them in your production applications, ones that you wrote to do whatever you want, ones that aren't doing things that you often think of as like kernel-y sorts of things. Um, a unikernel doesn't have to be a network router to have its own network stack. So an example, um, we made use of this in Docker for Mac and Docker for Windows. It might surprise you if you don't work for a big enterprise that your work laptop might have like, some really complicated network setup going on. We discovered when um, we started getting more beta users, particularly uh, Windows beta users, who often were part of these like, super locked down corporate networks, that a lot of people had complicated VPN setups. They had uh, custom DNS that they absolutely had to use. Um, they were getting filtered on outbound traffic, so we really had to actually pay attention to what their network settings were. And it was additionally confusing for our users because when they opened up their terminal outside of a container, when they just had their terminal open and started typing like NC or trying to, or trying to look up a web page, they're like, I can get to the thing. My computer knows how to get to the thing, but my containers don't know how to get there. So we were trying to figure out how to solve this problem. Um, we had initially set up a somewhat we had initially set up a more complex thing that involved setting up a real bridge between um, between the virtual machine that we use uh, to serve containers in Docker for Mac and Docker for Windows, and the host networking. And this is really prone to failure um, for the reasons that I have listed there, and also because your computer actually has multiple outgoing network interfaces, and you can switch between them all the time. And if you're not doing the right thing in custom networking, like that breaks horribly and immediately, and none of your containers can do anything, and you're very sad. So in order to solve this problem, we used a unikernel networking library to re-implement a, uh, a pretty classical solution to this problem. Um, the inspiration was a piece of code from the, uh, I've, everyone pronounces this differently, but uh, QEMU, QEMU uh, project called Slurp. Um, we took it, we hacked on it a lot, and we called it VPN Kit. And the way that it works is this VM is um, the, uh, the VM on which the containers are running in Docker for Windows and Docker for Mac. It wants to send some packets. And we don't, um, on, this, on this particular uh, level, we don't really care what they are. Um, we, write v we wrote VPN kit to take those packets, look at them, see, OK. What does this actually represent? This is an attempt to go out to google.com on port 80. This is an attempt to look up what the current time is from NTP. OK, I know how to do these things within the context of the host networking stack. So if this is a UDP request, I'm going to make a, I'm going to make a socket call with SockDgram. This is a TCP request. I'm going to make a socket call with SockStream. Um, I'm going to figure out how to map all these things properly and, and get, them, uh, get them back to the VM when the return traffic comes. And we were able to do this really quickly without having to write, like, um, the, the reason that this isn't really great in QEMU is all of the parsing code that takes all of the network traffic from your virtual machine 
and tries to figure out what it is, is bespoke code that never gets exercised in any other context. And they couldn't reuse any of the code from, um, from traditional kernels to do this because uh, they're in user space. And it's basically enough work to uh, pull, it, pull it out of a kernel and drop it into user space that it's not particularly, uh, it was easier for them to just rewrite all of it. But the problem is there are a lot of edge cases in parsing that they just didn't have enough input to commonly come across. So the user experience with Slurp was really bad. Um, and uh, in, my in my experience, it's still, it's, it's not particularly amazing. But we were able to make it better because we had something that we had to, we not only had tested um, in more common circumstances, but we could test a lot easier. So all of the components um, that we use for parsing in VPN kit are separate modules that we can just feed whatever random data to that we want. So we can find out if we have pattern sensitivities, if we're, um, if, if we're not checking a field the way that we should be, if we're just being too trusting of length fields and we'll try to read some area of memory that we shouldn't, um, which because we use uh, not C for this is not as big a deal as it sounds. Um, languages that help you, they're great. So VPN kit is a small piece of a unikernel. It's a small piece of a library operating system that sits inside Docker for Windows and Docker for Mac and just sort of quietly makes things better. And part of what we're saying when we say that we want evolution and not revolution is we want to use these technologies that are solving problems in good ways to make everything better. Not just the experience of people who are like, who wake up in the morning and are like, I want to run a unikernel today. I definitely want to run a unikernel today. I'm totally going to run a unikernel today. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's going to be, that's probably a tiny section of the, tiny section of programmers that are in this room. And probably no non-programmers are ever going to wake up and think that. But I want everybody to be able to send their traffic. So you may have been imagining something, may have been imagining something a little bit more dramatic, um, despite the subtitle of the talk. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Something like, okay, tell me how I can take a unikernel and I can run it with Docker tools. Because I hear unikernels are the new hotness, like containers are so over. And everybody's on unikernels now. I want unikernels, but I don't want to like change anything or do anything different because that's hard and I'm busy. Uh, I just want to be the coolest guy on Hacker News that's running the most unikernels. Um, and I'm sorry. I don't have that answer for you yet. Um, but what I hope I've convinced you is that what you really want is to fulfill a set of criteria for the artifacts that you're creating. And whether they're unikernels or containers or processes, or something that you run through a JavaScript transpiler and run in your browser. As long as it fulfills your requirements, that's not important. Um, having said all that, if you were at DockerCon uh, EU in Barcelona, you saw a really impressive demo of someone running some unikernels with Docker tools, um, which, which is an extremely impressive demo, uh, which I cannot replicate right now, because there's a small thing that you sort of need in order to make it work which is you need access to, to a hypervisor. You need access to a specific hypervisor on the machine that you're running it in. And uh, because this is, a, this is a Cubes machine, this is Zen. I can't expose dev KVM. I'm sorry. Um, if you're interested in seeing this demo, uh, there's, um, I'll, post the, uh, I'll post the link to the YouTube video here um, in the slides, which I'll also publish. The, um, we're looking at ways to Make this experience actually be what the demo of running Docker Run and having a unikernel go looks like it is. We will have succeeded when you don't need to know or care that you're running one particular Linux hypervisor, and you've provided privileged access to it in your containers, and you've set up, you've set up your networking in such and such a way, and you've applied this kernel patch that makes, uh, that makes the VTAPs work. That's when, we'll come, that's when we'll talk to you about how you, how Unikernels, how you can just build ship and run a unikernel when it's great. That's when we'll have done what we need to do about unikernels. And sometimes you won't want one. Sometimes it won't make any sense. 
They're a really nice fit for if you have a whole bunch of really small things that are um, nicely expressible, if you have like a nice microservices architecture, which is part of the reason I think that so many people who are into containers are interested in unikernels, is that they've sort of already figured out how to make things be single process. They've already figured out how to make things be nicely segmented. So it's not such a huge leap um, to, go from, to go from containers to unikernels. But sometimes you still won't want one. Sometimes you'll want, um, you'll want something that, sometimes you'll still just want to have some code and give it to your friend and say, friend, please run this through your interpreter and run my cool Python program. Make sure you're running Python too. We don't want to stop anyone from doing that. We just, it should be possible to run unikernels. It's just another target. And if you feel like you absolutely can't wait, like this is the thing that you're waking up for in the morning, this is the talk that you were most super hyper mega pumped to come to, and you know that unikernels are the future, and you're on Hacker News and you're like, yeah, but it should be unikernels. You can make it happen. Like, we don't have too many people who are working on unikernels at the moment. Um, there's, there's still room for at least you and maybe all of your friends and maybe all of your friends' friends. We have a lot to do. So um, here are a few places that you can go check out. Um, if you want a concrete, um, if you want to look at the code that's a concrete example of how we're using unikernel technology in a broader application, uh, go check out VPN Kit. Um, HyperKit is the hypervisor um, that we use uh, in Docker for Windows and Docker for Mac. Um, and that's also a reasonable place um, to start digging into if you're, if you're wondering a little bit more about how running unikernels might possibly work um, in a context that's a little bit more like the nice experience uh, for Docker for Windows and Docker for Mac that we've tried to build. Um, please do not take from the inclusion here that um, you should go and file an issue that says, doesn't run unikernels, F minus minus worst package would never run again. Um, but this might be an interesting thing to go look into. Um, if you want to read more about unikernels outside of the context uh, of Docker, um, there's a really nice landing page at unikernel.org where you can go and get a nice list of, um, you can uh, connect with other people who are interested in unikernels. You can look at lists of unikernel projects. You can find out more about where it might be a nice place to start if you're coming from kind of an application developer perspective where you might want to find out, okay, how do I run my stuff as a unikernel? Or how do I find a unikernel project that's in my language or a language that I want to learn? And um, finally, a somewhat selfish plug. Um, if you're particularly interested in Mirage OS, uh, we are having a summer hack retreat. So if you want to come hack on stuff in person, um, the, uh, the Mirage OS homepage uh, has some information on that, or come up and talk to me. And um, if you have questions, uh, I'm not a particular fan of live Q&A, um, because I've been in too many places where the question began with, I have a comment and took the entire length of the Q&A session. Um, but I welcome questions uh, informally. Um, just come up and talk, and maybe like if you're waiting for your question and like you really want to talk to me, but there's like other people and they're also waiting to ask a question, you can ask each other, and like somebody might know. It's super cool. Um, you can reach me by email at my Docker address, and um, you will be able to grab these slides uh, from Hub um, once I've published them. Uh, I stole them shamelessly from Justin, uh, who did the same thing, so. Special shout out to Justin for basically letting me use his slide template. Um, and uh, I, had a, I had a thanks slide in here. Um, I also just wanted to thank uh, all of the amazing folks um, who've worked on the projects that I mentioned um, and who have given me moral support uh, throughout um, my involvement in all of this. So thank you very much. And thank you for listening. Thank you for your time. Make some cool stuff.